was going to say, I think there's still a couple more people to join, but I will we'll get started because we did say it would start at 3.45. So we're here this afternoon with Alan. Um, Alan is from Evidence for Learning. Um, Alan's going to talk you through Evidence for Learning and give um, sort of a walkthrough of how it can be used and how some of the schools that use equals materials and evidence for learning how they use them together um so i will pass over to alan in a second just some sort of basic admin um if you've got any questions alan is happy to answer them there will be sort of a time for a q a session towards the end but if the, as Alan's going along, if you've got sort of any burning questions that you want to ask, if you put them in the chat and then I will sort of put them to Alan as we go along. Um, so anything else, if you think it can wait to near the end, then Alan's happy to do a, a proper Q&A session towards the end. Um, so I will pass over to Alan. Thank you, Sarah. Hi, everyone. Good to be with you all today. You can see there's a number of colleagues that that I know and we work with, so it's good to see you all. But we get asked quite a lot by schools around how they can make the most out of evidence for learning in relation to how they're implementing the uh, equals curriculum. And so one of the things that this has given me a really good opportunity to do is to go and talk to some of the schools that are using equals alongside evidence for learning to to get that information. And that's what I'm hoping to share with you today. So for the agenda today, I thought I'd keep it really simple. I wanted to start with something of a, a quick introduction, quick intro and background to evidence for learning. I guess both for colleagues that are not necessarily familiar with the app, but also for colleagues that are almost just as a primer really to simplify everybody's understanding in terms of how the app works, what it can do. And that will hopefully then give a, a foundation for some of the ideas that we'll explore today during the course of the session. The, the major part of today's uh, uh, session is going to be a, a walkthrough. We're gonna have actually have a look at uh, how one school in particular is using evidence for learning to support their approach. And we're gonna look at another school as well briefly. And I'll introduce those schools as we go. After we've done the walkthrough, I thought I'd bring it back together and just have something of a reflection, and maybe this can lead on to the Q&A session at the very end, but something of a reflection to look at the, the purpose and quality of evidence in terms of why do we collect evidence? What is it that we want to do with it? What are we going to be using it for as a school? And therefore thinking about the, the quality of that evidence in terms of what what kind of information might we want to include within that evidence so that's that's my thoughts for this session and as as Sarah said please feel free to post any questions in the chat and we can either deal with them in the flow of things or at the end depending on when we think it's most appropriate so As I said, I thought it'd be useful to start with really an intro and some background to evidence for learning. We've been working with the specialist sector now for, uh, this is our 12th year, so for quite a long time, and we've very much built evidence for learning uh, in partnership with schools, with specialist schools, specialist settings. More recently, in the last couple of years, we're, we're working with more and more mainstream schools. Obviously, that's where increasing numbers of our SEND learners are now finding themselves and our schools are having to, our mainstream settings and colleagues are having to support those learners. But we've really developed evidence for learning as a as really in partnership with those schools, very much as a joint endeavor. And there's been really three guiding principles that have, have, have shaped, I guess, how, how we've approached this. You, you can think of them as challenges big questions and as i say there's there's three of them the first one is how can we support 
and improve collaboration. And what we're thinking about here is, is really connecting that entire team around the child. So with, with our, our learners with SEND, there's invariably a, a, a team approach, isn't there, colleagues? And within that, we've got a team within school. So we have support staff, teachers, you'll have curriculum specialists and leads, you'll have middle leaders, senior leaders, and that's one part of the team. You've also got, uh, in many cases, a, a multidisciplinary team. There may be clinicians, therapists that are involved in a particular learner's um, support and journey. Um, if they've got an EHTP, there's going to be colleagues from the local authority, depending on where they are. There might be job coaches and travel trainers and all kinds of other colleagues that all have a an interest, but also potentially an input into that young person's learning. And then, of course, right at the heart of it, we've got the family and the learner themselves. And and the question is there really, how do we how do we give everyone a voice in that journey? How do we share our understanding? We know those learning journeys are really unique. And so, so how can we share share our thoughts, share our reflections. And that was our first big question to solve with evidence for learning. The second one then is, is thinking about those learning journeys. So for each learner, how can we create a very rich and, and vivid picture of what learning looks like for that learner? And, and then what can we do for this learner over here and then that learner over there. So you, you've got lots of different learners. They all have a very unique profile, often unique learning characteristics. You know, how can we kind of create a picture of what that looks like? And the idea is not just videos and photos, they're great and they're really useful and important, but we're thinking much more a comprehensive picture, more of a narrative. And then within that narrative, how can we very easily thread through all of those important elements that relate to that young person? So it might be in terms of uh, if they have an EHCP, how are we meeting the need? How are we meeting aspirations that are outlined in those? How, how can we show the breadth and depth in the curriculum, particularly in that lived experience that that learner has, particularly for some of the most complex learners, what does that look like? So that was really the second part of this. The third part then almost links back to the first part. So it's saying, okay, we've got this emerging, evolving picture of learning over time. How can we use that picture to then inform our practice to be more effective? And, and how can we maybe use it to support different aspects of school development and i've listed some of those there we'll, we'll come back to those i suppose most fundamentally we can think of it in terms of those professional conversations that we're having about learning that educational discourse how can we go into those conversations better informed and and and, and those are really our three foundational principles so be before you pigeonhole efl as it's our assessment tool or it's it's what we use for, uh, for, for, for our annual reviews, it's been designed to do a lot more. And so hopefully today, what I'll be able to do is give you some examples, give you some ideas, and, and we'll be able to, to look at that in action. I've put at the bottom here, improving outcomes, because obviously that's the whole idea here. It's how do we, how do we help schools to solve those three challenges with the ultimate aim that we're improving learning, we're improving those outcomes. And, and within that, we're thinking not just in terms of the learning outcomes, we're thinking about life outcomes. You know, how can we help schools better prepare the children, not just for adulthood, but for life? How do we prepare them for this weekend? How do we prepare them for Christmas or the summer holiday or whatever's coming up? And that's that's really the, as I say, that's the driving force. So as I say, hopefully that will give you uh, a a kind of simplification of what the app is all about. So I, I thought it'd be useful as well just to share some numbers. I, I said we've been doing this now for 12 years. The app is now used in, in literally just under 800. It's about 780, 790 specialist schools. So it's about 80% of the sector now use evidence for learning in some shape or, or form. And as I alluded to earlier, we're, we're now getting lots and lots of mainstream. So if there are mainstream colleagues on today, you're, 
extremely welcome. The rest of the numbers are there just to give you some, I guess, some context. So when when I'm sharing some of this stuff with you, it's it's, it's coming from really the fact that we're seeing what we have a quite a good position, I guess, a quite a good perspective on what schools are doing around the country. You can see we've got about 26 million pieces of evidence across all the schools. There's an awful lot of evidence there. Um, what's really interesting is that number at the bottom, which is growing really, really quickly. And that's a really exciting development. We we hosted our first conference, face-to-face -face conference for families a couple of days ago at Swiss Cottage School in London, where we had 70 specialist settings that were mainstream and, and specialist settings that came together for a day to share practice and hear from some keynote speakers around working with families and what high quality practice might look like and what some of the, the benefits from that might look like as well. So that's some context, but let, let's get into a, a live walkthrough and have a look. Um, so I'm going to now change over from PowerPoint to, I'm going to share my iPad. And this is where you're going to see me. I'm going to unashamedly work a little bit from a script because like I said, what we've been very fortunate and I'm extremely grateful to colleagues at Sunningdale School and D-Bank School because they've they've allowed us to pull together some examples of how they're using evidence for learning. So um, as I said, I'd like a special thanks to James Waller, the head teacher at Sunningdale School and Joe and the team and Delith at uh, D-Banks. So what we're going to have a look at is some examples. What I would say is there are many, many schools, probably hundreds that use EFL and equals. And the whole point with EFL is it's really a blank canvas upon which you can really organize and arrange and develop, going back to those first principles, a picture of what learning and what um, progress and what provision and really what that educational journey looks like for your children very much on your terms so it's not a prescriptive system so you'll see i'll actually show you three or four different ways that you might want to do things and certainly if there are colleagues who are using efl in different ways <laughs> with equals i'd love to hear from you and give you an opportunity to share at the end in the q a session as well okay so first things first that just uh, for those who aren't familiar with efl i'm sharing an ipad screen so i've got uh, an ipad in my hand uh, you can access evidence for learning on iPads, iPhones, Android tablets, Android phones, laptops, desktops, Chromebooks, pretty much any device. One, one of the benefits, if you are using it on a tablet or a phone, and this is whether it's Android or Apple, is it, I mean, obviously it's mobile, so that's a big benefit. But it actually works offline. So if you have fabulous enrichment activities where you're going outdoors, you've got outdoor classrooms, forest school, you go on school trips, you go shopping, you do all these kinds of things. Then you can literally take your device on the bus to the shops or wherever you might be in to the zoo or in the forest and gather up all of your evidence, bring it back to where you've got Wi-Fi and then it will synchronize and go with everything else. So that's just a sort of a maybe a useful detail. And for those of you who aren't familiar with it, this is pretty much it. There are six buttons. It's pretty hard to get lost. I'm going to start by looking at how we might gather evidence. And I'm going to keep harking back to those three principles, you know, that principle of collaboration, that principle of creating a picture, and then using that picture. So when we're thinking evidence here, we're not just thinking, oh, we've got to get some evidence for our assessment folder. We're, we're thinking here in terms of re reflective inquiry. We're thinking about becoming the expert of our children. And we're thinking about those links between assessment and curriculum, obviously, that, that kind of very much run through the, the, the kind of equals approach. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say, right, I'm linking it to a learner. So we're going to start with a young man here called Tyler. This is a completely made up name and learner. So we're not revealing any learner details here, just to clarify. I could actually link it to two or three different learners. Actually, that's is an interesting point to make. Some of you may not be familiar with this feature, but if I linked it to say we were doing attention autism task, we're doing what's in the box or something like that, then I could actually link it to four students. And instead of saving it then as a single observation, what it's going to do is duplicate it. So it's going to give me one for Tyler, one for Grace and so on. So then I can customize those 
because as we'll see, sharing with the family can be a really, obviously, an important sort of tool in your arsenal, if you like, to really kind of support learning, not just in school, but at home. I'm going to stick with, with Tyler for now, though. So I'm going to go with Tyler. I can then come along. I can take photos or videos. You can either take them in the app or you can record them and then add them later. So I've actually, for those of you old enough to remember Blue Peter, I've got um, I've got one here that I'm going to add that I prepared earlier. So I've got a nice photo here of Tyler doing some sticking and I could come back in. I can add another photo or another video. Equally, I don't need to necessarily add any photos or, or video. So these are pixelated for obvious reasons and, and the videos are, will have sound okay, under normal circumstances. If I want to switch the order of these, you can sort of move things around if you want. So I'm going to keep them in that order for now. Next thing, though, is, is I want to start building this narrative. So I'm going to go into the comments section and I can either sort of type into a, a blank canvas if you're using the iPad, you can hit the microphone and it will turn the device into a dictaphone, which I'll turn off. So a lot of people, that's quite handy and can save time. Or if you've got fat fingers and thumbs like me and always type in the wrong thing, it can be a bit quicker. The other thing that you can do is this magnifying glass will let you create templates. And so you can use those templates to scaffold. And this is where what a lot of schools I find and my colleagues find is they're encouraging staff not just to write about what's going on. It's really thinking about the learning, thinking about what is it your, what is it the child's learning and what are you learning about the child? And therefore, what are you going to do in terms of adapting your teaching to set up that next stage of learning for them? So that's why a lot of people will, will create those scaffolds. I've got an example here. So again, in, in that kind of made one earlier fashion. I'm going to come onto here and I'm just going to copy this text from here and I'm going to paste that in there. So there's my text in there. So I've he's doing something here around sat pin. Actually, that doesn't really tie up so much with the picture, but I'm just put something in there for now. We talked about threading all the key elements through the narrative. So this is where we can use frameworks. So for colleagues that are familiar with this, you'll You'll be you'll you'll know what comes next. But before I do hit this button up here, I just want to give a, a bit of a disclaimer because this is my demo. So I use this for training, consultancy, showing schools, all kinds of things. So in a minute, I'm going to hit this. You can see a list of about 150, 200 frameworks. That's not typical. Colleagues on the, the, the meeting on the call will be able to sort of share their experiences. But if you're someone who teaches seven or eight children, then you're going to have seven or eight frameworks in there for their individualized learning plans. And then if you're doing any sort of cross-referencing against any other frameworks, maybe you're using sounds of intent, maybe you're using um, certs, maybe you're using Boxall Profile, maybe you're using White Rose Maths, whatever it might be, the map formal milestones, you, can, you might have some frameworks for those too. So this long list that I've got here is not relevant. You may be doing some kind of accreditation around ASDAN or AQA, whatever. So, so, so basically with an evidence for learning, you can have two types of framework. The first type we refer to as a PLG, but as you can see here, you can call it what you like in your school. So in, in your school, if short-term learning targets are known as PLPs or ILPs or PLIMs or POPs or whatever, that's what they're called in evidence for learning. So that's the important thing. Everything is framed around your vocabulary and your language. So what I'm looking at here, this is Tyler's short-term learning intentions. You can see right up here at the top, we're actually looking at his learning intentions for spring. Now I can change this view and say, right, this is what we were working on in the autumn. Or I could change it to say, look, this is everything we've looked on so far this year. Now, some schools and colleagues on the call, I'm sure will be able to attest to this. Some schools we I've noticed, they might have one specific learning intention or maybe two within each area. It's completely up to you. You can create your own templates. A lot of schools organize learners and the curriculum into pathways. 
So they might have a preformal, a semi-formal, or they might call them seeds, flowers, orchards, woodlands, whatever language you use for your pathways. Within EFL, you can have completely different headings, different categories. I will just come out quickly just to show you what I mean. So I know that some schools that use equals will use and set learning intentions under those topic areas. So there literally is not, there's, there's no limit. Some schools, I've seen them use PFA, so they maybe use the preparation for adulthood headings, or some would use a combination. We'll go back to Tyler's though. So you can see here, these are the learning intentions that we're working on at the moment with Tyler. Those gray dots that you can see, uh, what that means is, is we've got some evidence. It, it doesn't mean that he's completed it. It doesn't mean that he's now mastered or he's at eight or nine, if you're using map or any of that at all. It really just means that we have a picture already. We have a, we have an emerging picture of what that journey looks like. So think about you're going to be going into your meetings, your planning meetings. You might be going into an annual review. We know we've got some evidence and we're going to look at that evidence in a moment. And I can come along now and I can cross reference this to any other item. So He's doing some work around SAP pin, so I'm going to link it to his SAP pin target. I might also want to say that he's doing work with his, with, this is this is an example of him working with his uh, fine motor skills and looking at finger and hand strength and dexterity. So I might link it to those. Okay, so I've made that connection between, that's my first thread, if you like. So I'm bringing the learning intentions in. Now, it, it, in... In this particular school, what they do is alongside the learning intention, they're also mapping where that aligns with the EHCP. I'll show you in a moment. I don't want to show you too much too soon in the same example because it will get confusing, but I'll show you how other schools have done this because you can do it lots of different ways. But that's where they're making that connection between the short-term planning and that long-term planning. But let's say we also wanted to cross-reference this to, say, other frameworks that we're using just to support our planning, just to look at sort of where we might be planning to sort of, to sort of sequence learning, maybe around if we were developing math skills or, or you might see something around using frameworks like certs or you might be using frameworks around, like I've got here, map formal milestones. So you could you could have that in as a framework. What these are, these are examples of that second type of framework. So I said initially you've got two types. So we've looked at the first type, which is personal. So these personal learning goals. So you'd use that for EHCPs, ILPs, support plans. And you could either have separate ones for those or a single PLG that incorporates all of those elements together. That's one type of framework. The other type of framework is what we refer to as a, a non PLG, so no, it's not a lot of jargon to remember. And that just means it's basically not personalized. So this could be like, I mean, I've got footsteps here. So some these may be curricular related frameworks that some of you might be familiar with. And the idea is, is I can cross reference and I can cross reference to as many of these as are, are relevant to my particular learner. And it's very, very easy to add frameworks. We have frameworks that you can add if there are common crown copyright frameworks or general frameworks those are usually in the system already you can just add to your system most or certainly many of the schools will create their own frameworks they might have frameworks they developed around literacy and maths and independent living skills or functional skills you might have something like this where you've got functional skills you can link to as many frameworks as you like so hopefully you're seeing going back to that second principle of we're creating not just pretty videos, but we're really linking learning. We're, we're illuminating where that learning is. We're incorporating all of those threads. So that's your frameworks. And I've gone overboard there, obviously, but just to demonstrate the point. Next up, you've got this feature called tags. Now, the idea of tags is, is as you're growing and growing your evidence, tags will help you navigate your evidence. And so this is another case where I'm going to show you a list of about a hundred and something tags. I've pulled these in from 20, 30, 40 different schools. And in fact, the great thing about tags is they're, they're an opportunity for you as a school to not just incorporate, but to embed the language that you use. So your language around how you talk about curriculum, how you organize your curriculum. If you've got themes, if you've got topics, those can come in through the tags. Your values as a school, 
So I've got down here examples of value. So if you've developed values around diversity, kindness, relationships, think of the tags as a way of just flagging up, hey, this piece of evidence is a good example of X. So British values, how are you developing British values with your most complex learners? What does that look like? So we can come into here and we can say, actually, look, this is an example of what we're doing. And we'll be able to look at an example in a moment. I mentioned earlier about the collaboration piece. I say we'll keep bringing it back to those three principles. Where you've got clinicians working with your students, they're not able to get in the classrooms as often as they would obviously want to. And so what a lot of schools will do is if they've got a video, they've got evidence that they want that clinician to look at, you can tag it. They can log in remotely. They can watch the videos back. You can jump on a Zoom or a phone call and it gives you a chance to really work out how you might want to refine practice, adapt what you're doing on an ongoing basis without those colleagues having to physically be in the room. So these are all ideas for using tags. How, how they use the tags at Sunningdale School is they'll use that to bring in aspects of the semi-formal play curriculum. Okay, and where that's coming through. So you can see here, we've got a whole bunch of tags. They're all prefix, semi-formal play. And so if we're, you know, we're doing some sticking, I might want to say, look, this is an example of art. And the idea is you'll see in a moment, we'll be able to search and say, look, what have we got around art for Tyler? What have we got around drama for Tyler? What have we got around British values um, for Tyler and so on and so forth? Another common use of tags is looking at engagement. En engagement is often a, a big part of a lot of people's approach. And, and here we're not talking necessarily about summative assessment for those students that are not engaged in subject specific learning here we're looking really at engagement as a almost as formative assessment as a, a pedagogical approach to, to to really understand what are the motivators for a learner how can we really help them be attuned for effective learning and so one of the things that some schools will do is create tags for engagement I'm going to show you another way to use engagement in a second, but this is a way that a lot of schools will sometimes use it. So that's your tags. So you can see I'm starting to build this picture up. The other thing I'm just going to point out, at any time I could save this. So if it's a really busy setting and I really haven't got time to be doing anything now other than just snap a video, save it, you can come back to a piece of evidence as often as you like. Next thing is you can see there is indicators. Now, all of these elements are optional. You could literally make a piece of evidence as just a comment. And quite often that'll be the case. It's just a little post-it note. It's a note to yourself, something before you forget, quick reflection, something you observed, something that you think you want to share with the rest of the team. It can have all these elements or any combination of them. What the indicators let you do is a, is a deeper dive. So if you think about it already, I'm sure you'd agree, we've got a fairly rich picture already. It's fairly comprehensive. We've got videos, we've got within the comments, we've got what we're learning, what the learner was learning, what we think the next steps are gonna be, how we're maybe gonna adapt what we're doing. Um, you can see where we're hitting different priorities for that learner, different learning goals, short-term, long-term. Potentially we can see where they're having the opportunity to practice specific skills if we were using excuse me, say a literacy or a maths curriculum. And you can see through the tags, we've also brought in some important elements. What the indicators let you do is, is be even more forensic. So these are some examples. Um, some of these are preloaded. So when you have evidence for learning, these come out of the box. And anything you see here, you can adapt, change, you can create your own ones. I'm going to go into engagement because that's the most common use of the indicators feature in EFL. And it's actually how the majority of schools certainly probably several hundred are using the app to develop and support their use of engagement. So again, remember here, we're thinking engagement more as pedagogy, more as okay, I'm looking at this learner, how engaged are they today while we're doing this exercise? So what you've got here is here are the five areas of engagement. And let's say I want to look at persistence. So what I can do with this is I get this screen here and, and this screen is completely customizable. So a lot of schools don't like to use the engagement scales. Sunningdale don't use the engagement scales as far as I'm aware, so they, they wouldn't have this turned on, but many, many schools do. The first thing I might want to do, though, is see where it says quick review up here. I might want to go back to here and we're going to go back and watch the video again. 
So it's going straight into that reflective inquiry mode. Quite often I was chatting with Joe and other colleagues and um, very often what they'll do is it might be the, 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 the TA is gathering some of the video or they've set up an iPad in a corner of the room on a tripod. And then this becomes a really important part of the process because they're really sitting down then as a team, watching that evidence back, watching the videos back, having that conversation. Hey, look, do you see this? What do you see? And it's a really, really good way there to... To, to, to actually coach support staff. That was one of the things that Joe said, and I know James has said that and many other colleagues as well. So it's, it's a really good opportunity to sit down and just check, do we all understand, what do we understand by persistence? What do we understand by engagement, et cetera, et cetera? What do we think that looks like for Tyler? And then what you do have the option to do is if you are using the scales, I can just tap and say, right, I think persistence wise, he's pretty disengaged. He sort of lost interest fairly quickly, I might say. That's my observation. And then you can use these text boxes if you want to. And these can all be customized. This is what it looks like out of the box. These are based on the original research by Professor Barry Carpenter, who developed all the original research around engagement as pedagogy. Uh, obviously, that was using seven areas of engagement. So it's been condensed into the new model. And Barry's actually worked with us. He's been our lead education advisor on our advisory board since 2017. So he's had quite a bit of input into a lot of this as well. But the um, this these can be used to record my reflections. So again, it could be the team reflections. We're having that conversation. What happened? What do we? What, why do we think that happened? What can we learn from that? What might we do? You know, how did they respond? And and so on. So that's that's how we can use this to build up a picture of what the engagement of Tyler looked like during this activity on this day. The as you can see here, you don't need to necessarily use all the information and you don't even need to use indicators as I say at Sunningdale they don't use indicators at D banks I think they do we certainly do with some of their learners and again with many schools what I found anecdotally is that schools might use this with certain learners at certain points in the year because it gives you a nice forensic picture to help build that profile but then maybe the rest of the term they're just maybe using some of the tags and they're keeping it really quite simple what's interesting is once I've done that and I go back to here you see that just sits as another layer so you can see it's part of that picture and part of that narrative and then if you've used the scales you can see there's a spider web there so if I hit that spider web what it does it gives me a nice visual representation uh, as I said we've always tried to make this as simple and thought-provoking conversation sparking as possible so the idea here is we can look at that picture straight away I can see no persistence you know, why do we think that was? What might we do differently? Was there anything externally going on today that we should consider? And, and that's really the essence. So that's um, our gathering of evidence. So building up that picture. So I'm going to save that. And then we can get into that third principle, which is like a using that picture. So we've got evidence growing and growing over time. How, how can we use this? So what I'm going to do is I said there's only six buttons and most of the rest of them are to do with that. So this middle button here, this lets me quickly and easily scan the evidence for maybe I could look for evidence according to tags or I could say let's look for evidence according to a class or learners. So I've said here let's look at everything we've got for Tyler so far. So this is all um, a bunch of evidence here and you can see a little filter up here in the top and I can use this filter because at the moment I'm saying, look, let's have a look at everything we've got for Tyler. I could could actually say, let's have a look at everything we've got for Tyler this term or so far this year or since the beginning of key stage one. Again, whatever you want to look at. And actually, this bit works even better if you're on the laptop because you've got the bigger screen and it lets you do a, a couple of other different views. But let's say we want to look at it and say, right, let's have a look at what we've got for Tyler around our semi-formal play thinking problem solving included maths. And so what that does then is it immediately gives us the evidence that relates to that in a timeline. So we can see where we were back in November and we can kind of go through some of this stuff and we can review the evidence. We can play any videos. You can see it's all tagged. You can see how it's been tagged to multiple areas of the curriculum. We've got 
the comments where the teacher's breaking down is it's very much a kind of reflective process what the next steps are what are we going to do differently and so you can imagine the advantages of being able to share this across the whole team i'm going to come to families in a second i might want to look at say reading for example so what i might do is come down to here and again you wouldn't normally have this many tags so i'm kind of trying to filter through so many different tags if in your school you would have one set of tags covering say literacy english you'd have another set of tags maybe covering maths but if i wanted to say right let's look at everything to do with um, english so then I've, i'm going to get all of that evidence that's coming through and then maybe we want to say well actually look let's let's be quite precise and specific let's look at what we've been doing around language comprehension and in this I, I obviously i've only pulled through a selection of the evidence but you would have evidence potentially going back several terms even several years if you've been using the app that length of time one of the really actually quite a moving conference that we had in london on tuesday because we had a lot of families actually talking and one of the parents said that they've what's really powerful is they've got evidence of their child from being pre-verbal to actually reading stories in front of the whole class. And you've got that entire journey through videos all documented. And so it can be a really powerful celebration, apart from being a powerful tool for you as teachers, it, be it becomes that, that wonderful celebration of that amazing work that you're orchestrating as the teacher, leading the learning, coordinating the team, but also the amazing mountains that the learners are climbing on a daily basis too. So that's the the tags and if i wanted to 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 be you know i could go in and say well what does british values look like so i could say well look let's look at you know for our most complex learners we've got some examples here these are all I, I, they're all fuzzed out and redacted for obvious reasons but you can see here how how we're using that picture we're building that picture up we're picking up lots of different elements we're able to pick demonstrate how this child is not just learning themselves but how they're interacting with their fellow students and peers and other people as well so that's the first thing that we can do let's stick with the go back to the collaboration theme and we talked about the families so a really really big part of the app for many schools not not day one but once they get established and settled with it is looking at that work in partnership with families and so I'm going to come out of the main app now alongside the school app there's a, a family app and the, the way this works is it's like a slimmed down version of the main app but obviously it's tightly restricted so your family could download it from the app store but they need a username and password to get in until you give them that they can't get beyond the login page uh, and and even after they've logged in they don't see anything they won't be able to do anything unless you share it with them or you give them the permission to do something but where this be has become really powerful and we saw this a lot at the conference on tuesday is is like i said it's it's really enhancing that work in partnership with families a, a great thing that you can do that's really really easy to do is to share evidence so naturally you can imagine it's it's great for alleviating anxiety that families might have around how their son or daughter's doing in school today um, or how they're settling into the new class or how they're getting on with a new teacher or, or, or they've particularly had a bad weekend and so on. So one of the things you can do is really quickly and easily share evidence with the families. And the way it works is you can share just the videos. If you want to share something really quickly, like a wow moment, very, very quick and easy to do. Just tap a button and then it will appear in the, in the family app for that parent. What's been really interesting over the last few years, and if, you, if, you, if you're interested, you can go to our website. We've got a whole bunch of case study videos that have been recorded in schools. And two or three of the videos uh, speak to the fact that more and more schools are using this family app to share understanding, to share strategies. Like if you're, say, developing uh, new approaches to teaching new one-to-one -one strategies, um, maybe either with therapists or with specialist teachers, quite often what schools will do is video those sessions. They'll record it as a piece of evidence. They'll annotate it. They'll then share that video with the family. And it becomes a really, really good way of, of really showing that family, look, hey, look, these are what these, this is, this is what the transactional supports look like for you, for your son or daughter. This is what we mean by this. 
um, here, here are the prompts that we're using or, hey, we've really been working on this this week. It'd be really, really good if you could help him to look out or help her to look out for it over the weekend. And um, in particular, one of the videos that we've got, it was a, we interviewed a speech and language therapist at a, it was actually a mainstream school with a specialist provision in London. And um, she said the impact of using the family app has been really tremendous. It's really helped her to, 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 to generalize the learning into the home more quickly. Families have a much clearer understanding of what she's trying to do with their children. And so that's the idea with this is you can really use it to kind of build that shared understanding, share those strategies. The other thing though as well is you can allow the families to share with school. And obviously families have got so much to offer. They understand, they have a very much a, their own lived experience with their children, particularly around how they engage uh, and, and you can allow the families to collect evidence and you can create a simplified in, interface. So when the families collect their evidence, they don't have all the bells and whistles that teachers have. You could even hide these two bits there, the tags and frameworks. You could say, let's just collect some videos. If, if you see something relevant and useful, make a quick comment about it and then submit it. And then what you'll be able to do as a school is pick that up. And um, I'll just show you here. I've got an example here, actually, that we can look at. And if you... You'll see here, if it comes in from the family, you'll see it have a little banner on it that says, hey, this has come from the family. So we're able to see what the family have done. And um, like I say, it could be a really powerful way thinking about your assessment, especially if you're using MAP and you want to really be able to secure those judgments around generalization, maintenance, and that kind of consistency, fluency, and, and so on. It can be great to get that, those observations from home to really secure those judgments. So that's... Um, that's sort of sharing with families. What I want to come back to next is this part down here. So this is what we call the assessment area. And um, actually, I'm going to change the login on this one. And again, this is a somewhat unrealistic example because this is a, a, a demo account login. And I didn't really have time to create one bespoke for this session or specific to this session. But basically what you've got here, are we call these assessment books, for those of you who haven't seen them before. And you might notice there's two, two types here. You've got some of them have got a silhouette of head and shoulders and some of them don't. What an assessment book is, is it's a way of looking at the frameworks that you're using. And so if you remember right at the beginning, we said there's two types of frameworks. You might have the PLGs, which are the personal ones. And then you have the non-PLGs, which are the more general ones. That's what these relate to. So the ones with the silhouettes, they relate to a, a personalized framework. So if I go into, for example, Tyler's one, what the assessment book does is it gives me sort of three parts to it, really. So on the left, we've got the outcomes. So in this case, it's the learning intentions for Tyler. I'm looking at the spring ones. If I change this to look at, say, autumn for a second, I've now got these were what we were working on with Tyler during the autumn. So that's the first part. So we've got this kind of growing picture of the of our planning and the outcomes and so on the middle part so this section here here's all the evidence and what the app has done automatically for us is, is it's allocated all the evidence that's been collected it doesn't matter where it was collected it could have been collected at home it could have come from speech and language therapist you know teachers wherever and it's automatically allocated against each one so for example i could look at this outcome this learning intention here where we were looking at retail and you can see there's six pieces of evidence, but what it actually gives you is more than just a account. It's not about the numbers. It's, it, it gives you the opportunity then to walk through that journey. What did that journey look like? And so what we've got here is each of these is a snapshot. So we can go right back to November and you can see here, here's that first piece of evidence that was collected back in November with the observations, the reflections. We can start to come forward over time. And we can start to, to, to sort of see how, how that, you know, what that picture looks like from a kind of qualitative perspective. So what a lot of schools will do is tend to use this page to support planning. And you can imagine, because you're really kind of bringing everything into one place. 
most schools that I speak to as well, when they're having an annual review meeting, this really becomes a centerpiece of that annual review because it gives you that opportunity to dip in and out of different aspects of their learning, particularly if you're trying to negotiate or push for new or changes to um, existing targets. So that's the second part is you've got the evidence picture, the qualitative picture. The bit on the right then, here is our, you know, kind of our traditional assessment. So for those of you that are using MAP, this is where you can have your MAP assessment. And as you can see here, I've recorded a baseline or I didn't, the school recorded a baseline, the teacher, and then she's gone back in and done another assessment and I can go in and the assessments you make just by tapping like that. And the great thing is, is I've got the ability to see all that information in one place. I've got my map assessments. I've got the evidence together. I've got that longitudinal picture of, from a planning perspective, this is what we're working on now. If I was to, sorry, let's hit the change. If I look at the whole year, I can see how the year mapped out. Now, what some schools do, you saw this in one of the other examples I showed you, is they will, if I come out of here a second, I think I can show you um, with one of these, this one, I think, I don't know, this one. You'll see this is a, a different school, different model. This is, um, but I really just want to show you they're, they're using prefixes. So with this, you can then see very, very clearly, look, we worked on this during the autumn, this during the spring, this during the summer, this during the following autumn. So it's really, really handy for seeing that progress. And in this one, they're using a different schema. So if any of you aren't using MAP, then with this, you can use, you can pretty much define your own assessment model. So there's one last thing I'm going to show you, and then I'll, I'll move on to the other example. One of the things we can do is we can make a series of PDFs. So there's different types of reports that we might want to make, say for an annual review meeting, end of term report. I'll show you a couple of these now, and then we'll. I'm going to go to another learner because I've, I've got some other examples with the other learner because I didn't have time to prepare lots for Tyler. But making a, a very simple learning journal, I've called this a learning journal. If you want to call it something else, like a re end of term report or my story or whatever you want to call it, that's really easy to do. You just define the title here, you see. So I've got this called a learning journal at the moment. But to make one, it's three or four taps. So I would come to here, select a date range. So I could either do the whole year or I'm going to do date range here. In fact, what I'll, I'll do is I'll do everything and I'm going to do Tyler. So our next... So, right, let's do Tyler. Now, if I wanted to focus just on his learning intentions and I want just the evidence that relates to his learning intentions, then I could actually just select his learning intentions framework and say, I only want to see evidence that's linked to those. Similarly, if you wanted to focus just on social, emotional, mental health, you could say, right, I'm only going to pick up stuff that's been tagged social, emotional, mental health. So you've got lots of possibilities. One, one of the uses of tags, which I didn't really mention, but it's a common one, is if you've got specific interventions, specific provision, Lego therapy, Boris School, often that will be tagged because then you can look back and say, well, look, let's look at the, all the evidence we've got from Lego therapy or from Boris School. What, you know, what does that look like? Um, and what, what are we seeing? What are we observing in terms of learning, engagement, communication, et cetera, et cetera. But to make the the PDF, it's two or three taps. You literally just set your criteria. It then fetches all of the evidence. If you want to leave something out, you just tap on it and then you hit make PDF when you're done and then it's made. And then, like I said, just working through these six buttons, the one we haven't touched yet, this one. This links me through to all of the learners. We call it a learner profile. It's basically the space where all their stuff is. So any evidence, documents, so if I go to here, here's the document that I just made, and it'll put this logo of the school on it, and then there's our evidence. Now, you can either print this out, a piece of paper to give to the family. What, what most schools do is if they're at the stage where they've launched the family app, which most schools don't do day one, obviously, but if, that's, if families are using that, you can then share this with the family through the app so then they can use their printer if they want to print it out and so on and so forth. There are a couple of other types of reports that you can make. One of them, for example, is if you're using MAP, 
and you wanted to do a report like this where you take your learning intentions. This is one I made earlier, just conscious of time. So you can see here, I've, and you don't have to have all the targets. You can cherry pick which targets you want to include. The colors there, those are the colors that are, they're not fixed in the system. Those were the colors that were chosen when this was set up. I'm not saying these are the colors that Sunningdale used, but this is the, the one that was in the demo example. So you could totally customize these colors. So you don't even have to have any colors there, but you can see the baseline. You can see where they got to. So some of the schools will use these. I said I would show you a couple of other types of reports. If I go into this other learner, Michael, and I go into here, this is an example of if you've used those indicators to build up your picture of engagement, then, and in particular, if you've used the spike, the engagement scales, then one option you've got is when you make your learning journal, you have the option to include the spider webs in. So that some schools will use that because it's quite a nice way of representing engagement over time. See if we, you've got the information there, you see, and that becomes part of the picture. The other thing you can do for a number of schools do use the scales as well like this. So what this is doing, it's then looking at the overall engagement scales and it then breaks them down into those five areas. And the idea with this is, from my experience, the schools that tend to use this don't necessarily share this with families because it doesn't really mean an awful lot. It's quite abstract. But, and we have a video on our website where one school uses this, again, to have those conversations about what engagement looked like over time, particularly with the multidisciplinary team. They're looking to get input from speech and language, OTs. They can look at, you know, what was happening on this day when engagement dipped, what happened on the 26th of March, 2018. So again, it's more of a, a schematic, a picture to spark a conversation than a real scientific assessment. But, but again, it's very much up to you as to how you use this stuff. It's, um, it's, uh, it, it's, it's really a toolkit. So I'm going to switch back to my PowerPoint because I said I'd show you another example. I, as I say, a lot of what I was showing you there was based around how uh, Sunningdale use it. And I'll say now my apologies to James and Jonathan and Charlotte and the Sunningdale team if I've misrepresented any aspect but it's i mean having spent time in the school and looking through stuff you'd be well advised to speak to them to get the details and as i say they're not using the engagement model that i just showed you in that way with the indicators although many schools are one school that is is d bank so this is take um joe and delith and the team at d banks very kindly have allowed me to take a piece of evidence or one of the learners and you can see here what we've got here is one of the one of the young ladies at the school. This is the assessment book. So if you imagine I've identified, you can see just here, I've had to redact a lot of it for obvious reasons, but you've got her personal plan and this is one of the learning intentions. And then we've gone in and we can see the evidence. I mean, this is really up to the minute stuff that you can see here. And then if I go to the next one, you can see I've gone into, so I've basically tapped on one of the specific pieces of evidence and you can see how it's all developed you can see where she's linking it to the teachers linking it to the personal plan but she's also bringing in in this case sounds of intent so and i know that in sunningdale they'll use lots and lots of different curricula systems and ideas that teachers can use to help construct that 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 real truly learner centered curriculum approach sorry the curse has got life of its own but you can kind of see there she's used tags uh, there and then this is the thank you pardon this is the engagement so it's using the indicator so you can see she captured some of that information there and there's that spider web so look that's the the walkthrough piece as i said i thought it would be um maybe helpful to just tie some of this together and maybe take it back to what we what i talked about right at the beginning and in particular hopefully colleagues on the call will agree what really we've tried to do with EFL is is give something of a golden thread and, and these aren't my words these are I, I hear this a lot from leaders across the country is the app very much serving and supporting that golden thread of collaborative reflective inquiry within the classroom across the school between the classroom and home and really really trying to really 
support that whole process of working towards those outcomes. I mean, we've talked about the collaboration. Hopefully you saw that piece. I think one thing that hopefully came through, and this is where using the app, as you'll have seen, as a school, you've got a lot of choices as to how you set it up, how it's used. I think more and more what we're seeing is within the evidence, that really comprehensive narrative that's bringing together all of these elements. It's really about showing the relationship between assessment and curriculum. Where, where the EHCP is fitting in there and, and where everything is being aligned with need and aspiration as per that EHCP, but also obviously in line with your um, your own assessments and evaluation of that child and their needs and, and speaking with the families in terms of their aspirations and ambitions. We, we obviously looked at the reflective inquiry piece was obviously very, very strong. But also hopefully you saw something of that refining practice piece, that opportunity to work with the extended team if you're working with clinicians, how you can involve them in that process. And obviously what we found, I found speaking with a lot of schools is that, you know, the NHS, the clinicians, they have their own language and then you've got your educational language. And so the app can serve as a really useful bridge. You know, um, clinicians will often talk about attention. Teachers often talk about engagement and it becomes a really interesting platform to have that conversation to come together and obviously that can really help to identify those those best most appropriate steps forward uh, the cpd pieces hopefully came across one of the things that uh, this is one of the things that joe said to me is um, at d banks is she was saying that the apps really help them as a leadership team to understand what our staff perceptions around key aspects of learning you know questions around how, why is this communication what is it the child's learning in this instant and it becomes a really powerful tool to really see that process in action and to capture that process and as you as, as we saw if you're working with support staff it becomes a really great way to be able to coach your support staff i, I find often when i'm lucky enough to to get into schools is is i love walking into a classroom and you can't tell who's the teacher who's the ta sometimes because you can see that 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 the way they're working that conversation obviously when you start speaking to somebody you'll get an idea but it's the app can become a really really good way of, of as i say sharing your insights as a teacher with your support team this is what we're looking for this is why we're looking for it and the app can be really quite powerful in terms of capturing those conversations as i said i thought it would be useful just to finish up with uh, the reflection on why we collect evidence if, if this has done one thing hopefully it's helped to open eyes in terms of what's possible and that if you've got efl at the moment it, there's so much that you can be doing with it and hopefully this serves to give you some ideas. I, th I think the starting point I find when we're speaking, I spend most of my day speaking with head teachers, probably 12 to 15 schools a day. And a common thing I'm finding in those conversations is schools are really doing a lot of work around purpose and quality of evidence. Why, why do we gather evidence? What is it that we want to do with our evidence? How do we want to use it? And obviously, once you start to have a clear picture of that, and we've, we've obviously talked about some of the possibilities there, then that can start to inform what goes into evidence. You know, what, what, what's, what's the narrative that we're looking to develop here? And then questions like who collects the evidence, when they collect it, what kind of information. Hopefully you saw in some of the, the examples from Sunningdale, from D-Banks, I think the big thing to say that I've picked up on over the years, especially more latterly, is that schools are encouraging, leaders are encouraging their teachers, their teams to really capture the whole journey. Because if, if one of your goals is to be able to show what progress looks like from a starting point, and certainly if, if Ofsted come in, that's one of the questions they're going to ask. You can imagine if you've got a video showing, well, look, this is where Tyler was six months ago. This is why we're doing what we're doing. And actually, this is what we did. This is this is how we did it. This is what we looked at. 
this was what we found engaged him. These are what the motivators were. And you've got, you know, three or four videos over the last six weeks, seven weeks, then you've, you're able to tell a really powerful story. And, and that's something that we're seeing more and more in schools now. This penultimate slide, this is something that we pulled together in one of our workshops. So colleagues on the call might find this useful. And when I say workshops, this is with a group of leaders from up and down the country, school leaders, head teachers. And the idea here was it was looking at, well, in, in your schools, how, how are you using EFL strategically? How are you using it to support and drive some of those big, big questions? And these were the ones that came up. I'm not going to read through them all because we've kind of gone through a lot of them already. There's a couple, though, that I think probably are worth just highlighting. Why are we doing what we're doing at any point in time? How are we how and where are we aligning what we're doing to need? And hopefully you've seen through the examples today, it's it, you're able to really quite easily and quickly do that, whether it's bringing it back to the EHCP or whether it's bringing it back to some other kind of assessment or evaluation or aspirational input from the family. That's a, a, obviously a very powerful thing to be able to do, and it's really quite straightforward. How do we know? How do we measure? How do we assess? I, I showed you a couple of examples there. I guess the key thing is, is we've always developed EFL so that it supports that kind of ipsative lateral approach where pupils will make possibly small steps. They might make linear progress in some aspects of the learning or you know, that kind of famed spiky profile. But you've got that ability to really break down that break down that picture and as I said and as we saw you can have a qualitative angle to that assessment you've got the case studies you've got the, the sort of the, the rich narrative but then you've also got that whether it's map or whatever system you're using you've got the ability to have I don't really say quantitative because it's not really quantitative but I think I think colleagues appreciate what I mean by that the so what the what's next piece thinking about sequencing Hopefully you saw in those examples, and it's certainly something we can come back to in the Q&A if, if need be. One of the things we try to do with the app is make it really, really easy so that you can show that alignment between your short-term planning and long-term planning and how that sits on top of a, a, a strong foundation, a good solid curriculum, broad and balanced curriculum, but also has engagement running through it if that's something that you're using actively. And so that's a, a big, big part. And a lot of schools said that's one of the things that they've found really, really powerful from using EFL. And then I think the last one's the most important, isn't it? This idea of where's the young person in all of this. And we've always tried to maintain, as we've developed evidence for learning, as we've built new features into it, we've always had it so that the app can help you go in the direction of the child. <laughs> So that, you know, where that child's leading their learning, where they want to go next, you've got the ability to follow, to lay down those opportunities, observe, reflect, and then obviously help them make those next steps. And that's really, I suppose that would be the one biggest thing of all that, that I've picked up over the years that a lot of schools have said has, has been a big part of how they use the app. I think that's it from me. We'll open up to the questions. I do want to give a huge thank you to James and the team at Sunningdale and Joe and Delith and the team at D-Banks for A, giving me the time to share and explain. And as I said, I've, I've kind of taken bits of what they've done. I've also been aware that there are, again, there are colleagues on the call, actually, that I've had conversations with. You'll have probably noticed in our last meetings that I've picked your brain on a couple of things. So I would like to thank all of the schools that have fed into this presentation. I hope it's been useful. Uh, and, and certainly now, if anyone's got any questions, I'm really happy to open things up. And likewise, any colleagues that already use evidence for learning, if I've missed anything or if there's anything that you're doing, then please do feel free to chip in and share your ideas and things that have worked for you. But thank you all for your time. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Alan. I've, I've seen a couple of questions. So um, there is a question in the chat that says, is there a whole class overview? 
Yes, there is. Now, obviously, with that, that's a very broad question. So there's a broad class overview qualitatively. So you've got your evidence, and that's best done on the web version of the app because you can, you've can. you got a bigger screen, you can open things up. And I suspect what they might also be alluding to is if you wanted to look at assessment data. And I'm kind of hesitant to show this, but I'll give you a bit of a glimpse because there is uh, those, I know there's lots of people on the call that will be aware of this, but there is an add-on for evidence for learning, which is called insights for learning. And that's really designed to give you that overview, but also to be able to drill down into a specific learner. I might just quickly flash a glimpse, but I don't want to open up a whole new can of worms. If anyone's got any specific questions about this, I'd be really happy to arrange a, a separate session one-on-one -on -one and we can explore this. So, so one of the things that you are able to do with insights Sarah, can you just maybe confirm, is my screen sharing at the moment with the computer and so on? It's and the sharing iPad. with the computer and the iPad. Can see Lovely. both. Yeah. Yeah, that's perfect. So yep. the so if I go back into this, um, I'm going to go back into this assessment area here. And so I've gone back into my assessment books. Uh, now, I've got a couple of examples here where let me show you these ones. So I've got here two classes. So if you imagine, this is typical of in what we'll have in some schools. That's one of the reasons I've got different models here is because it's reflected some of the different models that schools might use. So here's another assessment book. This is based on a completely different school. This is nothing to do with D-Banks or Sunningdale. But you can see here they're using MAP. They've baselined a learner. They've, they've reassessed down the line. What the Insights app will let you do is create what we call dashboards. So this is a dashboard here. And what this is doing is looking at that data that we were just looking at. And it's giving us that information where we can get an overview. It's presenting this information. Obviously, what this doesn't tell us is anything about learning, but it can give you that information that can be, support some of the conversations that you might have. And that can be applied to your can be applied to your PLGs, your PLIMs, your IEPs, ILPs, and it can also be applied to subject-based frameworks. If you are using a subject-based framework and you want to look at where learners are at, where they've made progress, then that's something that you can do with the Insights app. I'm not going to go too much into this because it's a little bit of a detour, but that's that's definitely something that lots and lots of schools do, several hundred of them. No, that's brilliant. Thank you, Alan. And then I think I know the um, the answer to this because I think obviously when we're looking at the app, you can only see the three, but someone said, can you have more than three photos? Oh, I was gonna say you can have only one piece of evidence. Yeah, in one piece of evidence, you can only have three, but you can add, I'll just give you an example. So if I share my screen again, go back to the iPad. So I'm going to go into a different learner this time. So this is Michael. This is actually based on a mainstream school with a complex needs integrated resource provision. So you can see here, here we've got Michael's outcomes against his EHCP. The teacher's broken this down into kind of a sequence of short-term steps. If I go into this one, which is looking at consistently follow instructions with three key words. And uh, some, I know lots of people on the call will have seen this before a million times. Quite a common example that I'll use. You can see here, we've got, once again, a, a very much a starting point. You can see from the reflections, it's really showing actually where he's finding it challenging. This refers to P-scales, in case anyone knows, this was 2018. Again, this is, a, this is an authentic, this has come from a school. So uh, it's what they did at the time, back in that time. But just to answer that question, if you notice here, there was another piece of evidence with another video there. Like in this, she's trying to get him to put his sensory object down. And so she's exploring different strategies and capturing that journey. And then obviously the next, this is another week, he's working with another learner. So they're trying to just get him to put his sensory object down before he gets into his learning. And you can kind of see the reflections there. So that's, um, that's how that's usually handled, yeah.
thank you. And then this uh, is a, a sort of a general question. Catherine has said she's only heard of evidence for learning once before, and it's very interesting. Could you tell them what are the subscription prices for the school and family? And also, do the multidisciplinary team download their own app, or how is the information shared with them? Hmm. That's some, yeah, that last question is a really good one. So on the pricing, the best way for me to do this, because I can send you very precise pricing, Catherine, and likewise, if there are any other colleagues that don't already have EFL and are interested, let me, what I'll do is I'll, I'll bring up our website because on there, there's a kind of an overview of pricing. And then you'll see that you can. Um... So this is our website and so I need to get the Zoom menus out of the way. And then over here under pricing, you'll, you can see how it's broken down. And then, it, it, like I said, if you are interested in some of those other elements, then I can I can write to you directly and give you detailed pricing. And Catherine and anyone else that hasn't isn't really familiar with the product, if you want to have a a one on one sort of twenty minute half hour uh, walk through, then I'd be really happy to do that, and we can really frame that around your particular setting and school. So the pricing's there. The I mentioned because I mentioned about videos and case studies. If you go to EFL in action, there's there's lots and lots of videos. There's about another six getting uploaded over the course of this week and the weekend. So there's lots of different videos looking at different contexts. This is looking at using Thrive Approach in a secondary school. Post 16, there's lots of different examples. The other thing that we have is um, a lot of conferences and events. I mentioned we had this work in the families one. Any mainstream colleagues, we've got a free mainstream event coming up at the end of this month in Rotherham. But you, you should find quite a bit of information on here. And if you wanted to have a, a webinar or trial, you can you can either contact us through the website or, as I say, feel free to contact me through through these details here, alan.wood at theteachercloud.net. That's, um, that's our main office number. If you put a four on the end of that, that's a direct line that'll come through to me and I'm very happy to take any direct calls as well. Thank you, Alan. And then we've got a question from Cheryl. So I'm assuming that Cheryl, um, Cheryl School is using evidence for learning. She said, do you have a phonics framework we can import? I can't find one in the library. Yeah, so in the library, we just have a lot of the Crown copyright ones. But obviously with the, I mean, I said there's about, well, including mainstreams, there's probably about 900 to 1,000 schools that are all using the app that have uploaded frameworks. What I can do is have a chat with our team and have a chat with some of the schools. I'm sure there'll be lots of schools. I know two or three schools that have put phonics frameworks on. So if Cheryl wants to get in touch with me or get in touch with the services team, I'm sure we can put you in touch with a school that's got one. I've, I've never yet met a school that isn't happy to share frameworks. What, what we don't do is go into a school and take their frameworks and give it to someone else without their permission, obviously. But I mean, we've got probably half a million frameworks on the system from all the schools. There's a lot. So there will be one, there'll be lots somewhere. Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, and then Cheryl. the just quickly flicking to make sure I haven't missed any. Will a recording of this session be available on the equal site? I think that's probably one for me to answer. I we've recorded this. I'm going to send it to Alan first for him to watch over and make sure that he's happy with. And then, yes, I think we probably will. If if everything's OK, we probably will be making it available. Um, but. We just want to watch it all back through first before putting anything up. Is that okay, Alan? Yeah, we should be able to share. I don't see there being any issues. Brilliant. Well, I don't see any more questions in the chat. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to come on mic and ask anything, which you're obviously more than welcome to do. 
um, or if you're already using evidence for learning, if you wanted to share anything, then again, that's absolutely fine. And if not, thank you all for joining us this afternoon and for staying around until after five o'clock. Um, but that's the session sort of over. So feel free to log out unless you do want to come on mic and ask anything. And thank you, Alan, for thank giving you. us your time this evening. No, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for your, your time and, and, uh, and attention. Thanks very much.